Life.com. Now, in studio, here is your host, Kevin Conover. Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We are on AM 1170, The Answer, in San Diego, every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. You can also stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org. My guest today is Mark Arabo. Am I saying that right, Mark? Yeah, yes, you are. Okay, fantastic. Mark is a businessman here in San Diego and a national spokesman for the Iraqi Christian community. Mark, did you grow up in San Diego? I did. I'm a man in America, born in America, born in Grossmont Hospital in 1983. So uh, I've been fortunate um, to be uh, born in the best country in the history of the world and a uh, proud American. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, um, that's a pretty big deal, too. I, I was looking up, uh, you know, some information about you online, and I see you got a president, uh, you know, a photo there of you shaking hands with the president and everything. How did you become the national spokesman for uh, the Chaldean Christian community? Well, uh, I like to think of myself as a servant of uh, any cause, and I'm serving right now the ending the genocide in Iraq and Syria and, and fighting for Christianity throughout the world. Um, June of last year, we got reports through our uh, social media that they were targeting uh, children, they were kidnapping them, and ISIS was systematically trying to wipe out the, all those Christians in the world. Uh, we took the influence we had from the Neighborhood Market Association, and we flew to Washington, met with the president and his team, and the State Department and Congress, and we said, listen, this is very bad. ISIS is trying to wipe out the Christians in the region. Mm. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a war that uh, we need to know who the enemy is and go after the enemy. And um, let's save as many people as possible. And fast forward three weeks after my initial meeting at the White House, uh, they called me and said, Mark, you're right, ISIS is getting stronger than ever. And uh, they're growing like cancer. Uh-huh. Fast forward a year later, I've been in Washington countless times. I've been, I've been at the United Nations. Uh, been to Congress. We were able to secure 33,000 visas to help the Christians and Yazidis in Iraq. And now I'm going back next week, April 13th to April 16th, uh, to meetings again with Ben Rose at the White House, a meeting with uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, and with the State Department for them to reinstate and expedite the visa processing. Yeah. And yeah. we've said, you know, this is Bosnia all over again, this is Rwanda all over again, this is the Holocaust all over again. And the only difference is they're targeting Christians. Yeah. Now, did you, uh, you know, two years ago, three years ago, did you have any idea that this is a, a direction you were heading, or, or is this something that just kind of uh, was a, a complete surprise for you? Well, you know, in 2011, when, when President Obama uh, pulled all of our troops and our bases from Iraq, uh, I saw him at an event, and I actually uh, talked to him and, and was worried about uh, defending religious minorities in Iraq. And uh, I believe someone recorded it. It's, it's on YouTube and, and other uh, social media uh, okay. networks. Yeah. And uh, so I've been, I've been very vocal about it from the beginning because w- with the absence of uh, the greatness of America in, in dark regions of the world like uh, uh, Iraq and, and in uh, Syria, Christians don't stand a chance. And so what we've said is we've lost five thousands of our son and sons and daughters in this war. Um, we just don't want it to be in vain. Mm-hmm. And that's a powerful statement that America has had that kind of influence uh, on on Iraq and other places mm-hmm. in the world. Now, I'll do you tell have you that the, the yeah. American people are the greatest people in, in, in the world? It's the greatness of America and the most generous folks that. You know, care so much, that are, are so deeply rooted in their faith, hmm. and uh, do you credit that with their, do you credit, do you credit their Christian foundings, uh, Judeo-Christian foundings, uh, as the I do, source of I that? I do, I yeah. do, you know, America was founded on uh, Christianity, and, and founded on, really, the, the notion that, regardless of who you are, or where you come from, or what language you speak, we're American, and America is the, the beacon of hope, the beacon of light in the world. And uh, in the Middle East, the only uh, country that is even uh, uh, the light over there is Israel. I mean, can, Israel is the canary in the coal mine, and that's one thing the president has been very 
and he has not been good at, is securing uh, Israel to make sure that we are unapologetic in our uh, solidarity and our brotherhood, and to know that our greatest partner in the region is Israel, and because they want the same thing we want, is uh, freedom and democracy and uh, really peace for all. Yeah. Now, do you have family living in the Middle East? We, I do have distant cousins that still live there. The majority of my family has have come over in the late seventies, early eighties to America. Okay, but and we what, still have distant cousins. And but uh, what part right of, now? There's one hundred fifty thousand displaced, innocent lives and in, living in refugee camps. And I like to think of all of those Christian brothers and sisters as part of my family. Okay, and so we need everyone's help to join our mission, to join our journey, and raise your voice with ours. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, just for some background, I know these are kind of uh, just background questions. We have a lot to discuss here, but uh, what does it mean to be a Chaldean as opposed to someone else from the Middle East? What, for our audience out there, I, I'm in San Diego especially, uh, we hear a lot of talk about Chaldeans, but I know that a lot of people right. don't know what it means to be a Chaldean or, or what the history of the Chaldean people is. Do you mind giving us a little bit of background on that? Uh, of course. But I can tell you, every Chaldean, uh, Chaldean American identifies himself as American first. Uh, American first, and, and uh, that happened to be Chaldean. And Chaldean is a culture that, that goes back to Abraham. Abraham was, uh, was, was Chaldean. He was from the era of Chaldea. They're from Babylon. Yeah. Chaldeans are uh, Christian. They're Catholic. They are the oldest Christians in the world. And for centuries, for centuries, they have been persecuted. They have been killed. They have been massacred because of their faith. And the same thing we've said from day one, we're saying the same thing today. The terrorists could take away our homes. They could take away our livelihood. They could take away everything we have, but they can never take away our faith. They can never take away our God. Yeah. They can never take our Christian values. Yeah, it really speaks, uh, the, I mean, the history of the Chaldean people and... Uh you know, all the way from Abraham, really speaks to um, a spiritual dynamic here, a spiritual war, in the sense that there's just this constant persecution. Um, now, are are generally all Chaldeans uh, Christian, uh, Catholic, or or are they are there some Chaldeans that are also Muslim? No, no, the ninety nine point nine percent are all Chaldeans are in nature uh, Catholic, Chaldean Christian. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now. Um, and, and then as far as Chaldean culture is concerned, um, the Chaldean, I know that there's a close family uh, or a real emphasis right. on family among Chaldeans. I was, I was talking to a, a guy actually a while back, my battery had died, and he was a pickup uh, tow, truck, tow truck driver, and, and I got into a conversation with him, and he had actually come over from Iraq, and he said the biggest difference between coming from uh, Iraq and to America is that there's less of an emphasis on family um, is that, does that seem to be true? Well, I, I think, uh, the similarities are, are much greater than any difference. Mm. I, I do think the American family is a big emphasis. I, I know that for Chaldeans, we do, we greatly believe in, uh, in, in, uh, family, faith, uh, and country. Yeah. And that's something we want to support here in America. I mean, we, we actually are having somewhat of a breakdown of the family and we want I to, agree. uh, uh, bring that back up and bolster that yeah, and keep that going. And, and uh, once we have that sense of family, then you have a sense of patriotism, you have a sense of country. Absolutely. And and the core, you know, it starts with the it starts with the family. Yeah, yeah, and, stable and, uh, society. Yeah, I asked him, so uh would you ever consider moving back to Iraq and he said no, absolutely not. It's just never, it's yeah. just not safe. Uh was his uh and, and, reason. And I could tell you, you know, it, when, they, when a lot of Chaldeans came to, the, to California uh, in the 1950s, the earliest Chaldeans were in the Navy. That's why they came to California. Uh, the Chaldeans have come to America since the late 1800s, primarily living in Michigan. And when some of them got involved in the Navy, one, one of them came to uh, San Diego, and they called their cousin and said, listen, Michigan is cold. What are you doing out there? <laughs> we can it's go cold. to the... There's a beach out here, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's swimming. water. There's a beach. San Diego's gorgeous. Yeah. Come to San Diego. So the first one came, and then he brought his relative and family, and and fast forward, you know, almost uh, 65 years later, uh, we have around 70,000 Chaldeans in San Diego County, 
uh, it's growing, and and they're they're in North County, East County, South County, and West. Uh, you'll see them at the, the Padre game and the Charger game and the Everyday Americans. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's the great thing about it is that uh, all the Chaldeans I have known have uh, just completely. I, I mean, they love the Lord, they love Christ, yeah. they they love family. They're uh, and and you know they're just so happy to be uh, in America. Yeah, and, and, and I can tell you that values. every Chaldean I know every day wakes up, kisses the floor, and says, "Thank God for America." Yeah. Because America was the one country that gave hope, opened its arms to a, uh, a people that didn't have a country. Mm. That they could start over and do something with their life, put their kids through college, and uh, will forever be indebted. And, and Now, uh, now if, I'm, American. if I'm hanging out with some, a bunch of Chaldeans, is there anything I should know that, like, culturally, like, not to make any mistakes, is there anything I should be aware of? There's going to be a lot of food. They love food. Okay, so I just I got to make yeah. sure I eat a lot. So eat a lot. Yeah, is, is, it a big appetite is it offensive and, and, if I don't if I don't eat all the food that's no, out there? No, no, no. <laughs> never any offense. Just uh, uh, like everyday Americans, a, a, a good close culture you could combine it with is in the Italians. You know, Italians are big with food, family gatherings, Sunday dinners. Church is a must. Everyone has to go to church every Sunday or Saturday. Uh huh. Um, I remember growing up, I never missed a Sunday Mass my entire life since I was a little boy. That's and, fantastic. Uh, my dad and my late father worked really, really hard, but he said, listen, Sunday we go to church as a family, we pray as a family, we come home, we have Sunday dinner at our house. And, I, you know, if you see the, the Chaldean community, these are people that have left everything they own, everything they have, mm. uh, left Iraq and said, I will never give up my faith. I will never convert. That's amazing. Uh, well, we're Lord coming Jesus up. Christ, our Savior, and, and uh, they've, got, they've started over in America. Yeah. We're coming up on a break here. Uh, you can learn more about Mark on his website, endthegenocide.com. After the break, we'll get a better understanding of who ISIS, or now called IS, is, and an update on what is happening in the Middle East uh, currently. Our guest is Mark Arabo. Uh, we're very privileged to have him on, so we'll be right back. In 1947, Gordon Tucker began serving San Diego County families. Today, the family tradition continues with two stores, Tucker's Valley Furniture and Cash and Carry, both right across the street in El Cajon at Maine and Mollison. Whether you want today's modern, eco-friendly furniture or authentic Amish furniture from solid cherry wood built in America, let the Tucker family serve your family. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. A proud sponsor of Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. Wake up, America. Two-thirds of us are overweight or obese, and it's not your fault. End the guilt, frustration, and pain. Stop dieting, starving, and depriving yourself. Free yourself from the bondage of feeling trapped in your body. Forgive yourself. Achieve permanent weight loss with healing food. You can love food again. You can lose weight permanently. Thousands already have. Call now for a free DVD. Your body is a divine miracle. Learn how to activate the miracle. Call the Smart Food Club at 888 888- 8-787-8188. This is AM 1170, The Answer. Thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We are on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. You can also stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org, where you can listen to a recording of this show and previous shows. If you're just tuning in, my guest today is Mark Arabo. He is a national spokesman for the Chaldean Christian community, and uh, fantastic. We just learned a lot about Chaldeans in general. Mark, not too long ago, Al-Qaeda was the biggest terrorist threat. ISIS seems to have risen to power almost overnight. I mean, a lot of people didn't even know what what in the world, where did they come from. Um, When and how was ISIS created? Well... The leader of ISIS, Baghdadi, for those that don't know, was in uh, U.S. custody, and we released him in a prisoner exchange um, in the mid, uh, around 2004, when, and when we released him, he said, I'll see you in New York. So uh, he is a threat. Uh, ISIS is a, is a global uh, threat to the world. Now, w- um, now, would you say today that they're a bigger threat than al-Qaeda is? They're certainly, right now, more... Uh, more funded, more organized, and more vicious than than Al-Qaeda. They're a splinter group of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda actually kicked them out. They said, you guys are too crazy. 
um, and they've, they've embraced and used social media to attract so many people with different passports. We know people in Europe, there's some Westerners that have joined the black flag of ISIS. And with the absence of any real American leadership in American foreign policy, this cancer is, is spreading fast and deep. And uh, really the only savior uh, to the world right now would be America. And only America could, could uh, end this terror, terrorism. Yeah, so uh, how much territory does ISIS control currently? What um, You said they're spreading fast and deep. We know they're in Iraq and Syria. Right. How much uh, influence do they have there? Well, right now, they're, they're trying to do a caliphate. Uh, they're in uh, Iran. They're in uh, Iraq, I should say. They're in Syria. They're in parts of Egypt and in Libya. Wherever there is a, there is a dysfunctional government, uh, ISIS seems to be there. And, and the, the troubling part of ISIS is ISIS is an idea. And, and you can't kill an idea with a bullet. Mm. And ISIS is, uh, their tactics, their strategy are very sophisticated. They're very evil. And uh, they're very brutal. And okay. every single day, they're attacking different uh, folks that don't believe with them. They want to spread Sharia law throughout uh, the world. And that's one of the reasons why they went from ISIS to ICE, which is uh, Islamic State. They're trying to take over every single place they so can. So they, they were Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, right. and now they're just IS, Islamic State. Yeah. And when you say that they're they're trying to establish a caliphate, um, that's specifically kind of a uh, a global Islamic movement. Um, right. My understanding is that they actually believe uh, that other Muslims, even other Sunni Muslims, uh, are wrong. And if they don't, if, if somebody doesn't adhere to specifically their particular brand of Islam, then their life is at risk also. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the Shiite community, the Kurdish community, the Yazidi community, there's multiple communities that have been targeted. No one has been targeted more and hurt more than the Yazidis and Christians, though. Our community has been shaken to its core. Has been uh, our homes have been taken away. They, they've marked our homes in Iraq with the uh, the, the letter uh, N Arabic stands for Nazarene. Mm. They've taken away all of our uh, clothes, our belongings, everything that we once held dear. And the one thing they can't take away those are faith. And Amen, so once yeah. we found out about it, I went to Washington and said, "We need to rescue these victims." these innocent lives, these Christians, these Yazidis, now, they just want to live. Now, are, what, what percent of uh, Christians, or Chaldean Christians, made up the population of Iraq prior to this all taking place? So, uh, to give you just some perspective, in 2003, we had 1.4 million Christians in Iraq. Twelve years later, today, we have less than 300,000. Oh my goodness! One point one million have spread throughout the world, and fleeing is, just to is is that uh, the goal? It. Is that the goal of ISIS? Is to essentially eradicate Christianity from Iraq, from the world? ISIS's goal is to eradicate Christianity from the world, and they've started with the oldest Christians in the world, oh. and it's very strategically. I mean, they know that these are the oldest Christians. Uh, months ago, they bombed a church, a Christian church that was sixteen hundred years old. Oh, they've just destroyed terrible. museums. They've destroyed the, the, they bombed the tomb of Jonah. Wow. They're going to every historical site that's Christian. And there's so many uh, sites in, in, uh, in Iraq that are Nineveh and Ur and yeah. Babylon and all these places exactly. uh, where there's uh, numerous archaeological discoveries and so forth yeah. that have uh, actually validated it, it, the it's a, it's a full-blown Christian genocide and they're not stopping. They're getting stronger by the day. Our dysfunction in Washington and the dysfunction in our foreign policy has emboldened them. And uh, we've made it our life mission to save the people right now. There's 160,000 people right now that are homeless, living in the desert, living in terrible living conditions. And, and, and 90,000 of them are kid children, 10 years younger. 90,000 of them are kids. Wow. And so we have to do something. We have to. Yeah, and uh, I want to talk about specifically what you're trying to achieve in that. Um, but do do ISIS goals differ from those of like Al Qaeda? Are they 
you you was is this was this the goal of Al Qaeda also, or, or are they just picking up where Al Qaeda left off, or uh, and and where do they get their resources from? How do they have? Um, it sounds so almost kind of um, tribal or like yeah. Uh, it, it seems unorganized to me, but but yet, how can you make so much headway? Uh, right. How can they be achieving uh, all this without having organization to them? Sure. Well, right. ISIS is making around $5 million a day selling oil on the black market. The territories they've taken over in Iraq are a lot of oil, oil fields, and they're selling the oil to neighboring nations that are working with them. Um, so the finances, that's how they're getting them. They're using social media to attract people throughout the world and asking them to come join the black flag of ISIS, come be with ISIS. They're recruiting via uh, the Internet, via social media. They're glorifying these uh, really horrendous and brutal attacks. Now, what is the they, appeal of somebody going to, to uh, fight for ISIS? It just seems uh, very unappealing to me. Are they paying people to fight for them or... Is that what's happening? We, I mean, I, I don't think uh, I don't think the money is attracting the people. It's just the people that are joining ISIS don't have God in their heart, and they mm-hmm. haven't found. Uh, they don't have purpose. They they're don't look, have a conscience. They're looking for some sort of a meaning. They have no humanity. Life. They have. Yeah. They're looking for something to fill the fill the void. Mm-hmm. And unless we start uh, really preaching the good word and uh, attracting people to the good, to attracting people to God, there's going to be more evil. That's... I mean, there's no. Um, no other really solution, and and uh, well, that's think that's people. a powerful message. Yeah, and it's so true. Um, I think Edmund Burke is credited with the quote: uh, "All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing." And uh, yeah. the Bible speaks to the same thing. In James, it says, uh, "He who knows the good he he ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin." And so many times um, we are in a position where. There is something good. Uh, I, I heard a pastor talking about it once. He said, yeah, there's sins of omission and there's sins of commission. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, commission is when you do something you shouldn't do, and omission is when you don't do something that you should do. And oftentimes, um, we're just so busy about our lives that we forget that there are people around the world that are in uh, very dire situations. Um, yeah. So, no, And, and you're right. And, uh, and people are forgetting the notion that we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. It's on us. You know, life, if you look at it, um, we're, we're, we're born as, as, as little babies, and then we live 10 years or 20 or 50 or 100, and then we go as if it's a hologram. And God gives us the, the abilities and, and the resources and the food and the energy to do good in the world, to do good, to help the people that need the help the most. And this is our time. This is our, our moment for every single one, not, not just the Chaldean community or even Christian community, but everyone to defend these hopeless people and, and genocide. Yeah, because it's yeah. a genocide, regardless of what faith, or what God you believe in. Absolutely. No one should be killed because of who they believe in or who they love. And, and they're getting killed because they love God. They're That's, getting killed yeah, because yeah. they're Christian. Yeah, that is a that is a very difficult. Now, um, are people actually able to travel to Iraq right now? Are U.S. Uh, do any U.S. citizens actually travel there? Is anybody actually? No, there's no. a travel ban. Right? From what we understand from the State Department, mm. that we've actually even pulled out our civilians that work in the State Department for their safety. So no one is ever advised to travel into a dangerous zone. Is there uh, is, is there any kind yeah. of communication taking place? Like, are you able to communicate with anybody over yeah. there? Yeah. We actually have people that we sent, uh, that, and we developed a communication center in Iraq. And our communication center is giving weekly briefings to the people we know at the State Department. We could tell them in real time what's happening uh, and what we need to make sure that they, they're not dying in the desert because of lack of clothes or diapers or water or food, uh, we were able last August to get $600 million in humanitarian aid from the United Nations through, and through other groups like USAID to make sure that they have the diapers. But the stuff is running out. People are, are, are dying because they don't have the basic necessities. Uh, they're still begging to be rescued. Last year, 2014, we lost, uh, based on the UN report, 12,500 people 
We know their names. We know their families. We know their stories. It's a tragedy. Tragedy. Um, well, uh, but it's heartbreaking to hear about this, and uh, hopefully, uh, for those of you who are listening, that uh, this kind of touches your heart. And uh, Mark is going to give us some ways to be involved and make a difference. Um, but you should be praying, too, for these people every day. After the break, yeah. Mark will share with us what his views are of the relationship between the U.S. and the Middle East, specifically Iraq. Uh, you can follow Mark on Twitter, Facebook, or on his website, endthegenocide.com. We will pick up in just a few minutes here. Do you have one-button espresso machines in your home or business? They make delicious coffee drinks, but they're not maintenance-free. Express Fix Coffee is San Diego's source for coffee and espresso machine repair, sales, and service. Call Dave Martin at Express Fix Coffee for new and used espresso machines, repairs, parts, and accessories. They'll save you time and money. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. Learn more at ExpressFixCoffee.com. Wake up, America. Two-thirds of us are overweight or obese, and it's not your fault. End the guilt, frustration, and pain. Stop dieting, starving, and depriving yourself. Free yourself from the bondage of feeling trapped in your body. Forgive yourself. Achieve permanent weight loss with healing food. You can love food again. You can lose weight permanently. Thousands already have. Call now for a free DVD. Your body is a divine miracle. Learn how to activate the miracle. Call the Smart Food Club at 888-787-8188. Add historic American beauty to your home today with genuine Amish furniture. It's built in the USA from solid cherry wood with a bourbon finish. Or choose alternative woods and finishes to accent your home's decor. You'll find it all at Tucker's Valley Furniture. For over 65 years, the Tucker family has served San Diego County. Still family owned, Cash and Carry and Tucker's Valley Furniture. Two stores, both right across the street at Main and Mollison in El Cajon. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. Saying, I don't know, is no longer acceptable. This is AM 1170, The Answer. Thanks for tuning in to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We are on AM 1170, The Answer, in San Diego. Every Sunday, 4 to 5 p.m., we're discussing all kinds of issues, current issues, pop culture, uh, in light of a biblical worldview. You can also stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org, where you listen to a recording, where you can listen to a recording of this show or past shows. Mark, um, big question for you here. Why isn't the government of Iraq protecting the persecuted Christians of Iraq? The government in Iraq since uh, 2003 uh, has been completely dysfunctional. There's been factions fighting each other. Um, and they haven't been able, and, and they're not willing to take, protect the Christians or the minorities in Iraq. Right now, it's, it's, a, it's a disintegration of Iraq with the Shiites in the south, Sunnis in the middle, and the Kurds in the north. The ones that are getting killed and have no homes are the Christians and the Yazidis. And uh, really there is no protection for any uh, Christian or minority in Iraq. Right now, and there, I, we, we, we uh, expect there won't be for decades. Mm. Um, you wrote, but, uh, Mark, uh, in the Union Tribune article, you wrote, We are blessed to be in a position where we can work to rectify the religious minorities, which we, in effect, buried. The Iraq War put religious minorities in a position with little protection from their government because it dissolved the military and Ba'ath Party, which historically gave protection to Christians. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? On that, uh, what you're saying there? How? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Saddam was an evil, evil dictator and evil beast, but he was controlling other, greater, more evil beasts in the area. He was a very secular president that protected religious minorities because he felt that they were not a threat, and he felt these religious minorities would never hurt him because they're Christian. And so historically, you would never have been able to target a Christian or kill a Christian or bomb a church because the government and the Ba'ath Party would, would not allow you to do so, and they would actually defend Christians uh, with tenacity. So when, when the fall of, of his regime, which was a very evil one, uh, what happened was 
there was nothing put into the Constitution to protect Christians. There was nothing to protect them in the Iraqi government. It wasn't an inclusive government. And, and then the Prime Minister Maliki came, which actually suppressed them even more. So the with, so the the government that was set up was a democracy. Is that right? No, I mean it was a pseudo democracy. They tried to do a democracy, but when the fall, when, when the beginning of the war, the the borders of Iraq were never secured, and so you had when the fifth or sixth largest armies in the world that was dismantled within weeks, and the borders are not secure, and so what happened? You had every single terrorist throughout the region. Not Iraqi, Saudi, I mean, all these other countries invaded Iraq and, and, and preyed on the, on the weak and the people that didn't have army, the people that don't take arms, which are the Christians. Yeah, so the Christian community. And so for years, every year, we would have 100,000 Christians leave the country in mass exodus because they couldn't survive. And so what we were worried about in 2011, fast forward 2011, when, when the president prematurely pulled out the troops and pulled out our base. One thing I warned them about and what I was worried about is the Iraqi Christian community because these people don't have protection. The only reason why they weren't systematically killed was because America was there protecting them. When America left and we, we didn't have any bases, we didn't have any protection, uh, they were systematically wiped out. And now what we've been saying is, okay, we don't want to put any more troops on the ground. We've lost too much blood and treasure in this war. We've lost our sons and daughters in this war. Just let the Iraqi Christians leave the country. Take them anywhere. So is that Any basically country. the philosophy currently of, uh, of the current administration? Is, uh, you know, this will solve itself by the Iraqi Christians just leaving the country? I, the administration right now doesn't want to do anything. Uh, they're saying... The Iraqi government, the new prime minister, should do something. They want them to be inclusive. It, it's a it's a pie in the sky uh, uh, theory. It, it's very idealistic. It's not practical. We're working with the, the president and his team to make sure that they look at it a little differently, in the sense that when you have a genocide, when you have Christians being massacred, you need to help them get out, especially if they're going to be sponsored. Last year, we, we, we opened up a list of people, and we were getting phone calls. Within around two, two or three weeks, we assembled 70,000 names, 70,000 people. Wow. 70,000 human beings, Christians. That are, that, that are pretty much helpless, that can't do a thing. That are helpless, thing. hopeless, that are begging to be rescued. And then for every person, I matched them with an American-born citizen spons- that's willing to sponsor them. So I have 70,000 victims, Christians that are dying to be rescued. I have 70,000 American citizens that are saying, hey, get these people to America. We will adopt them. They won't take any social services. They won't take any social programs. We'll get them a job. Oh, that's fantastic. And I've given that list to the State Department, to the President, and to the Speaker of the Congress, Boehner. And uh, we're pushing. We're waiting. So, we're so not, Mark, if you had things your way, if, if you were, you know, uh, had, had the power to get things done, what would the U.S. be doing now? I, I hear what you're saying, but beyond um, these sponsors, bringing these people to America and so forth, what would, be the, what would the U.S. be doing that it isn't already doing? I think short term, we have to... Uh, airlift the, the Iraqi Christian Yazidis out of Iraq to make sure that not one more innocent Christian dies. Get them out of Iraq. Similar to what we did in, in the Holocaust, we, we saved the Jewish community. We have to save the Iraqi Christian community right now. The, the, the most incredible community to us recently has been the Jewish community. APAC and other folks have, have come to us, have called me, we have I've spoken to them all the time. They said, Mark, we know what it's like when your people are getting killed and no one is listening, nobody's watching, yeah, nobody's caring. We care. We're here for you. And so they've been incredible. And we need to learn from our, our history. I would save all the Christians and Yazidis right away, get them into a safe zone, a safe area, a new home. Right, now, are you talking about actually bringing them to America, or are you talking about somewhere that's safe uh, nearby, near near Iraq? I know that there was for a while some places that 
seemed uh, relatively safe in Iraq, but it looks like those places are disappearing too. Right. There, there is no longer a safe haven in Iraq or the Middle East uh, for Christians. And even now with the, with the violence in Israel and with, with America's lack of um, really uh, focus on helping make sure Israel's strong, just not now but forever, yeah, uh, Israel is having to defend itself, which has historically never happened. Um, so you think we, that that uh, the president's, you know, he's talked this deal with Iran uh, and so forth, and um, do you think that this is also affecting the Chaldean Christians? That uh, that the decisions he's making with Iran does Iran play a role in this at all? I think it does because the Iran community is is really the propping up the Shiite community and uh, with this new prime minister in Iraq. And it's going to be uh, a war for decades between the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds. There's no safe haven for Christians. Ideally, it would, it, we would say, let's have an inclusive Iraq for everyone. Iraq, uh, Iraqi Christian, Iraqi Kurd, Iraqi Shiite, Iraqi Sunni. But there isn't. And so we need to match them with sponsors in America. But I'm also talking to France, to Sweden, to Canada, to Australia. We're talking to other 10 countries at the U.N., and to say that these Iraqi Christians should go anywhere in the world, not just America. Yeah. They should go to Europe, they should go to Australia, they should go to Canada. But every country I named, they've all told me, Mark, when America starts taking these refugees, we will take them too. Because everybody's waiting on America, because America is the leader of the world. And Obama's waiting on everybody else to move. Exactly, and that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Obama's waiting on everyone else when he should be leading not following. Yeah. America is the leader of the world. We're the greatness of the world. Yeah. The yeah. biggest superpower out there, period. Absolutely. And people look for look at us for direction and and when we look at them for direction, they're confused. That's what do we do. And that's what the pickle we're in right now. Do you think there's any uh, chance of a secular leader ever arising again in Iraq or in uh Syria that would uh, play the role that Saddam Hussein played? You know, I, I think in the future, down the road, uh, but I'm talking decades, yeah. we're hoping that they're going to be. Yeah, it's... The short term, the international community, not just America, the international community should do international ground force to, to wipe out any terrorism, to wipe out ISIS. But it's going to be long, it's going to be a long uh, winded effort. It's not going to be quick. Mm. But short term, the 150,000 innocent lives that are living in the desert they don't have time. We can't wait. We can't say, let's fix the country and then they'll be okay. Because by the time we fix the country, the people will be dead. Yeah. And these are innocent children, innocent Christians that are just wanting to go to church every morning, to say mass, to raise their families, and live a good life. That's all they want. Yeah. Uh, be Christian, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. When we come back, uh, Mark is going to share with us what he's accomplished to help the Christians in Iraq and what he is currently trying to accomplish. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Very uh, powerful and uh, significant discussion we're having here with Mark Arabo. Add historic American beauty to your home today with genuine Amish furniture. It's built in the USA from solid cherry wood with a bourbon finish. Or choose alternative woods and finishes to accent your home's decor. You'll find it all at Tucker's Valley Furniture. For over 65 years, the Tucker family has served San Diego County. Still family owned. Cash and Carry and Tucker's Valley Furniture. Two stores, both right across the street at Maine and Mollison in El Cajon. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. Do you have one-button espresso machines in your home or business? They make delicious coffee drinks, but they're not maintenance-free. Express Fix Coffee is San Diego's source for coffee and espresso machine repair, sales, and service. Call Dave Martin at Express Fix Coffee for new and used espresso machines, repairs, parts, and accessories. They'll save you time and money. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. Learn more at ExpressFixCoffee.com. 
Wake up, America. Two-thirds of us are overweight or obese, and it's not your fault. End the guilt, frustration, and pain. Stop dieting, starving, and depriving yourself. Free yourself from the bondage of feeling trapped in your body. Forgive yourself. Achieve permanent weight loss with healing food. You can love food again. You can lose weight permanently. Thousands already have. Call now for a free DVD. Your body is a divine miracle. Learn how to activate the miracle. Call the Smart Food Club at 888-787-8188. AM 1170, The Answer on iHeartRadio. Free, 24-7. Take AM 1170, The Answer with you everywhere. Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We are on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. You can also stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org. If you are just turn, tuning in, my guest is Mark Arabo. He's a national spokesman for the Chaldean Christian community, the, the Iraqi Christian community uh, here in America and around the world. He's fighting to rescue the Christians in Iraq that are being murdered and threatened to leave their homes or die. Uh, thousands and thousands, 150,000 people displaced, uh, more than 12,000 deaths last year, 90,000 kids uh, essentially stranded. And... Mark, I wanted to ask you, so far, what have you been able to accomplish? I know um, you've been working on this for a while. What legislation have you been able to pass uh, in, in the past, and also what are you currently working on today? So uh, since June of last year, we've been able to pass and, cr- and craft House Resolution 683, which recommits uh, America to religious minorities in the Middle East. We've been able to secure $600 million in humanitarian aid from the United Nations to make sure that the 150,000 people stranded in the desert don't die from the basic necessities. They get their food and water and diapers and clothes that they need. We've been able to secure 33,000 visas uh, for that region. And uh, we've been able to lift the conversation of this Christian genocide, not just in California, but in America, throughout the world through the White House, through the State Department, through Congress, and through the United Nations. And uh, there are visas now. Uh, We just need to make sure we process them, get that people out of this living hell into their new home. And so this year, we uh, helped uh, craft a bill uh, with local congressman, Juan Vargas, that has bipartisan support uh, with Duncan Hunter, that they're saying uh, House uh, Resolution, uh, H.R. 1658. And what that does, it reinstates and expedites the processing of these visas to make sure that these religious minorities are not forgotten about. This is our moment for the world community and and, uh, every Christian person and and, and non-Christian, every human being, to have their conscience woken up. And we've been working really hard to wake up the human conscience, the world conscience, because this is a genocide. We need to save the victims of the, from this genocide. And we've started this uh, this effort to end the genocide June of last year. I'm working on it every single day, seven days a week, from so early morning to late night. This is your full-time job now then, huh? This has become my uh, almost three jobs. I, I'm working almost 100 uh, hours plus a week on this specific issue, traveling to the White House, to the State Department, to Congress, to the UN, uh, talking to as many networks and, and channels and radio stations as possible. Uh, the other day we had someone from Hollywood come down and write a script about what we're doing. And what I've told them is I'm laser focused on saving the people. Yeah, so you we said need everyone's help. You from said in Hollywood the, to Washington to save the people. You said in the last segment that um, you know that it's a matter of time that if we try to you know if we, if we wait to to rebuild the country or whatever the case that it's going to be too late by then. What kind of a time frame are you looking at here where you feel like this has to get done? What what uh are you talking within the year this year 2015? Are you talking just shorter than that? What are you thinking? We need action right away. I'm pushing the president to make sure we get some executive action. Last year, when we met with his team, they said the president is very uh, anti-war. He cares about, um, he's very deliberate. He campaigned on anti-war, and uh, 
He wants to make sure there's no new wars. And what we've said is we need airstrikes and humanitarian aid. And the reason is because if he doesn't deal with this, then the cancer of ISIS is going to spread. Airstrikes will contain them to a region, and humanitarian aid will make sure they're not dying from the basic necessities. Literally one day, 24 hours after our meeting at the White House, the president gave us exactly what we needed. He gave us our airstrikes. He gave us our aid. That's amazing. Aid. That's amazing. Now, um, you've got people all over the place praying for um, these Thank people and, and praying that the president would move and, and that right. the roadblocks would be cleared out of the way. Um, you know, uh, you find prayer to be very, very critical in this, right? I think prayer is the most critical element and the most thing that we need. We believe the power of prayer is going to be the solution to this genocide. It's going to be prayer that helps us overcome this evil. And uh, that is what we're asking every single person to do. Pray for us every day, every night. Yeah. And James- God is great, and he just needs to hear our, our voices to his heart and to his ears, and it will be him that, that saves us. Absolutely. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? And uh, I think that really speaks to the situation. Um, if, if you know, we can't you know, travel with you to the White House or uh, the UN or whatever, um, like you're saying, the most important thing we can possibly do is, is pray. And yes. uh, everybody out there can take the time to pray. And that's the great thing about God is that um, he allows us all to be involved in uh, rescuing people. The Bible, Christ said, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And, and so... Um, Everybody out there, I just encourage you, you know, um, we all have our priorities and the things that we're doing, but when it comes to something like this, um, it's time to kind of lay down our own lives for a, for a period of time and uh, intercede on behalf of these people in Iraq, uh, our brothers and sisters. And uh, on your UT article, Mark, you wrote this. You said, for the Christians of Iraq and Syria, this legislation is life or death. And my message to members of Congress will not change. If you choose not to support this bill, you are sentencing my people to death. There is not a simpler way to put it. The decision to not support this bill would leave Christians throughout the Middle East to continue to rot in the refugee camps they have had to call home. To silence their voices any further would be further enabling and emboldening genocidal actions of ISIS. I ask Congress to firmly consider the implications of its actions uh, if this act is seen as anything less than necessary. Voting not to support this bill is enabling ISIS. Those are powerful words that you're uh, sharing there, and uh, obviously you continue to, to feel that. We can sense the passion in what you're sharing. Thank you, and, and it's from the heart. It, it's, it's, uh, this legislation is life or death. We want every single member of Congress to vote yes for it, to push it through. And uh, we need every single person to pray for us, pray for our journey. Join our journey on endthegenocide.com. This is for humanity. It's much broader than a certain community. It's for every single one of us. And uh, this is our moment that, that, that God is, is, uh, is the only one that could save us. I, yeah. this is, I firmly believe in, in the divine mystery and in the divine power and, and our prayers together as a nation, as a people, as brothers and sisters throughout the world, no matter where we are. God hears us. God sees us. Absolutely. And... and uh, we just need to pray and say, please, God, Now, open, uh, open the door. Again, Mark's website is endthegenocide.com, and on that site, there's all kinds of information you can get there. There's a history of uh, what's happened in Iraq. Uh, there's also the history of Mark's involvement there on the site. And um, then, Mark, there's also some stuff I noticed on the site about ways that people can uh, get involved if they want to somehow uh, make a difference uh, what what kind of options do you give on the site for people to get involved uh, who can do more than uh, maybe others? Well, uh, there's a lot of things people could do. The main thing is, is get involved through our Facebook, through our website. Um, pray for us every single day. You yeah. recommend that they contact um, their senators and those sorts of things? Um, yeah, is contact that... your local representative, contact your, your member of Congress. 
Um, and then really tell everyone about the Christian genocide. Let them know. Do they know that there's Christians being massacred because of who they believe in? So spread uh, the just them, spread the word. Spread the, spread the word and and pray. You and even, then uh, if anyone wants to support any of the of the folks in Iraq, there's ways through the foundation where they could help. Um, whether it be donating clothes or, or, or water or, or supplies or diapers, whatever it may be. Okay. And nothing is too small. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Mark, for being on the show today and making us aware of what's going on in Iraq. I really uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a very busy guy. Dan, thank you so much. It's been an honor and privilege, and I hope that, and we ask that everyone please uh, prays for us and helps us end the genocide. Okay. The Bible says in Hebrews 13.3, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So, uh, powerful scripture there. Please visit Mark's website again. That's endthegenocide.com. There are plenty of ways to get help on, or to help out on his site. For a recording of this show, visit my website at educateforlife.org. Next Sunday, we'll be discussing the evidence for the truth of the Bible from archaeology. We'll actually be speaking with an expert on archaeology and uh, looking at the evidences that, from archaeology that show that the Bible is a valid historical book. Um, that's going to be on am1170theanswer.com. God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic evening. Educate for Life with Kevin Conover, a regular feature on AM 1170, The Answer. Learn more about Kevin. At